Welcome to this Jeremy Bamber podcast. Sheila Caffell was Jeremy Bamber's sister, who died in the tragedies on the 7th of August, 1985. In this episode, we'll discuss some of the evidence surrounding Sheila's life and her serious mental health problems, much of which the jury didn't get to hear about at the trial. On the 18th of July, 1957, young unmarried hotel receptionist Christine Webb gave birth to a healthy baby at Springfield in Bath. The birth was registered three days later and the baby was given the name Phyllis Webb and she was immediately up for adoption with the Church of England Society. Christine's father had made the decision that Neville and June Bamber would provide a caring and loving safe upbringing for his grandchild. On the 15th of October 1957, the adoption was completed and the infant's name was changed to Sheila Jean Bamba. Neville and June doted on Sheila, who thrived in their care, a child whose unique and complex personality would soon develop. For the most part, Sheila was happy, although she had numerous insecurities and could be very demanding, requiring constant reassurances which continued and increased throughout her life. When Sheila was four and a half, June and Neville completed their family when they adopted eight-month-old Jeremy. Sheila was a fun sister who always looked out for her younger brother and the siblings spent a lot of time together on the farm before they went to separate boarding schools. Sheila had a great sense of humour. Jeremy recalls, Sheila had a running joke with my dad. She always bought Dad slippers for Christmas, whether he needed them or not. Each year she would parcel up Dad's slippers in different shapes or add weight, like a log or something funny, so that we would all think she'd bought him something different. Then when he opened it up, it would be slippers, of course, and we'd all laugh. She had a very mischievous sense of humour. Sheila loved listening to music and singing. She would always switch Dad's Radio 4 to Radio 1, and when he got up in the morning, would find Radio 1 blaring out, and it always made us giggle. Approximately six miles from White House Farm is Malden Court Prep School, which was attended by Sheila until she was ten. Then she attended Moira House Girls' School in Eastbourne, joining mid-term, and so friendships among the students had already been established. Nevertheless, Sheila was very popular and made numerous friends. Always generous of spirit, other girls didn't see Sheila as a threat, despite her striking beauty because she was funny, with an infectious laugh, and was always extremely good company. She spent time helping other girls do their hair and makeup and advising on fashion tips. For some reason, Sheila was expelled from this school, no doubt owing to her mischievous nature. After this, June and Neville found it difficult to place her in a private school, but she was eventually accepted at Old School Norfolk. Sheila was very happy here and made a number of friends, and again was very popular. It was now that Sheila earned the nickname of Bams. However, Sheila had growing insecurities and lack of self-confidence began to notice. Regina Knockhold, one of her closest school friends, said, She was an extremely attractive girl, however, she lacked a certain confidence. She needed her friends and was quite demanding of her closest ones. At school, she was never able to undertake things on her own. Kind and gentle, Sheila was a talented writer and wrote wonderful stories. She was artistic and did a lot of drawing and paintings. She enjoyed music and also sang very well and wrote out song lyrics to learn them. She enjoyed 60s music like the Beatles and she would also sing Pink Floyd and Marianne Faithful songs. As a creative individual, Sheila struggled with subjects like science and maths But despite excelling in English, art and music, she left school with no formal qualifications at the age of 17. She went to live in London where she enrolled on a two-year secretarial course at St Godric's College, a finishing school in Hampstead. Sheila hoped that she'd be able to develop some skills for a stable job. The course began on the 4th of September 1974. But Sheila found no room in the course for her own creativity and left six months later. Hoping to develop her creative nature and love of fashion and style, she began her first job as a trainee hairdresser at Robert Fielding's salon, 
while attending a secretarial course in the evenings. Sheila also worked for a brief time as a trainee hairdresser at John Frieder's. Encouraged by comments from customers at the salon, it was during her time at the hairdressers that she began to consider a career as a fashion model. Despite having some insecurities, Sheila dressed to impress and turned heads in the street, not just because of her looks, but because of her ability to pick out the right clothes to suit both the occasion and her fun character. Sheila embarked on a career as a fashion model and enrolled at the Lucy Clayton Modelling Agency in South Kensington. And one of her first assignments was on a photo shoot for a Bacardi advert in Martinique. She really enjoyed this job and returned with stories about how many of the girls became sunburnt and the shoot had to be delayed, but they had lots of fun which boosted her confidence. However, this was short-lived and long-term Sheila struggled with life as a model. She expected to be treated appropriately and professionally by male photographers and soon found that many made unwanted sexual advances towards her. Without reciprocating the affections of men who were in powerful positions, Sheila found that some opportunities for photographic work dried up. Living in London with modelling friends, Sheila invited the 16-year-old Jeremy to stay. Jeremy loved being with Sheila and her friends. They took care of him and showed him the sights of London. Sheila and her modelling friends attempted to eat tissue paper as a way to fight hunger in the search for the ever slimmer body. Fortunately, though, Sheila didn't develop an eating disorder, but she did feel the extensive pressures on her as a young woman trying to build a career in London. In a search to improve her chances of work, she also had breast implants. But with the highly competitive nature of modelling, Sheila found that she lacked the confidence and robust psychology required for such a trying and demanding job, with extensive travel and tight time schedules. Despite not being used to having the aggressive tenacity needed, Sheila still persisted in trying to carve out a stable career. A lot depended on her success because she sought financial independence from her parents and long-term wanted the security that she believed would come with a husband and family life. At the age of 17, Sheila met Colin Caffell in the Three Horseshoes public house in Hampstead. Colin was an art student and four years older than Sheila and something of a dreamer. The relationship quickly blossomed and within days Sheila took Colin to meet her parents. Colin had concerns about how the Bambas would react to a long-haired art student being in a relationship with their daughter, but his concerns were unfounded and he was made to feel extremely welcome by June and Neville. Sheila soon fell in love with Colin and he became the love of her life, the only man she wanted. The couple were initially happy and spent as much time as possible in each other's company. And in 1975, they moved into lodgings together in London. It was at this time that Sheila discovered that she was pregnant, and according to Colin, he wanted to have the baby, but Sheila wasn't certain. After much thought, it was decided they were too young to start a family, and after Sheila and June had received reassurances from the vicar about the moral implications of the pregnancy, it was terminated. The relationship between Sheila and Colin was fractious, and arguments eventually became a normal part of their daily life. When Sheila's fiery temper got out of control, it was common for her to pick up the closest object and throw it, often in the direction of Colin. Occasionally, Sheila would take it one step further, be violent towards him, lashing out in temper, as Colin openly admitted in his witness statement, given on the 7th of August 1985, in which he said, She would also be violent towards me and also smash up my prized possessions. Sheila was very highly strung and, during arguments, she would become very violent. Shortly after Colin graduated, Sheila became pregnant again. And this time, it was decided that, as Colin was now in a position to find work and offer financial security, they would get married and keep the baby. The wedding took place on the 14th of May 1977 at Chelmsford Registry Office. It was a quiet ceremony with just a handful of their closest relatives attending, but Sheila did state that she wanted her cousins Jacqueline Wood and Anthony Pargeter to be there. Meanwhile. The other cousins, the Bowflowers and the Eatons, were not invited, although they did attend a reception 
at a motel a few miles from the village. As a wedding present, June and Neville bought the happy couple a ground floor apartment in Hampstead, which had a garden for the child to play, but sadly, Sheila miscarried a few weeks later, when she was almost six months pregnant. June and Neville now wanted Sheila to be closer to them so that they could see her more and June could help and so offered to buy Sheila and Colin a recently closed post office in Tulsa, Darcy that had living quarters, a shop and a number of outbuildings which could be converted into a studio for Colin. However, Colin refused the offer as he wanted to remain in London to build his business there. Sheila fell pregnant again, but this pregnancy had to be terminated as the baby wasn't developing properly. And it appears that Sheila suffered from postnatal depression after this very upsetting loss. After she was married, Sheila continued modelling and on one occasion got a placement on a job that was to take place in Tokyo, Japan. Colin admitted that he encouraged her to take the assignment, as he hoped to be able to join his wife after a few weeks because he wanted to visit the Japanese art museums. Unfortunately for Sheila, he never did make the trip. Alone, a long way from home without Colin and family and friends, she felt completely isolated and she had little confidence, which now plummeted. In a letter to Colin, She described her feelings of separation and desperation. I'm finding it very difficult to be myself here because in Japan there are only a few English or European models and it's very competitive. Everyone looks at you all the time, which makes me nervous because I feel that I'm being compared by people for looks with the other girls. Therefore, I'm behaving rather nervously. The other girl who I share a room with is very beautiful and chic and sophisticated, unlike me. In a second letter to Colin, she wrote, Don't get worried when I say this, but I really think I should go to a psychiatrist when I get back. So could you please arrange an appointment for me as soon as possible? And I will be very grateful. I've never felt so confused and unable to control my brain before. And I'd like to get myself sorted out as soon as possible. It's my self-confidence. Some days at jobs, I'm happy and self-confident. And other days, I'm not. And you can see the change in me when I'm not. They really don't like me on my bad days. It's almost as if I'm schizophrenic or something. I feel so sick of people and stale. It's terrible. I don't know what's happening to me at all. On Sheila's return, the change in her appearance was noticeable and what little spirit she had was broken. Colin described her condition as weak, thin, and broken. All the bubbles that made up the person I knew were gone. However, no appointment was made for her to see a psychiatrist as she'd asked Colin. This happened seven years before the tragic events at the farm, when Sheila was just 20. Yet it would be a further three years before her ever deteriorating mental health condition led her to first being seen by a psychiatrist at which time she was hospitalised. Had she seen someone first when she asked, things could have worked out differently. In July 1978, Sheila celebrated her 21st birthday party at the flat, but when Colin left the party with a woman, she was upset. The argument, which happened on his return, resulted in Sheila punching the glass in the bedroom window, badly cutting her hand. The guests made a hasty exit, except for Jeremy, who insisted he take her to hospital for treatment for her injuries. Sheila forgave Colin, but made sure she showed him the scars from her injury during future arguments. In late 1978, Sheila discovered that she was pregnant again, this time with the twins. Understandably, Sheila had concerns and the doctors decided that the best course of action would be to hospitalise her owing to preeclampsia, which confined her to total bed rest to give the pregnancy the best possible chance of success. She was admitted to the Royal Free Hospital in Hampstead, where she would remain up to the twins' birth. However, by this time, Colin had formed a relationship with a different woman, Jan, the daughter of a friend. In his book, Colin said, 
She was everything Bams had been before the miscarriages, yet at the same time so calm and peaceful. Everything I had ached for and hadn't had for so long. Out of a desperate need for love and support, I may have made a terrible mistake. Sheila believed that everything would be all right and her relationship with Colin would continue when she was released from hospital. But Colin had different ideas and later told Essex police that before the twins were born, the marriage was breaking up. On the 22nd of June 1979, Sheila gave birth to her boys and was overjoyed. At last, she had the family she craved. However, she was heartbroken when the boys were just five months old and Colin left Sheila to live with Jan. The stress of the breakdown of her marriage, financial worries, two infants to care for and her increasing insecurities now began to lead Sheila towards a state of mental health far more serious than anyone could have anticipated. Sheila tried hard to cope but found everyday life increasingly difficult. She loved the boys deeply and was instinctively protective of them. Peter Jay, Sheila's genetic uncle, confirmed to Essex police. The children were the centre of her life and without them she would have been lost. Sheila, though sadly, lacked the ability or natural motherly instincts to care for them properly. This was confirmed in a statement written by Colin's girlfriend Jan, who recalled Bams was a very caring mother towards the twins, but she seemed to lack proper control of them. She was very loving towards them, but didn't have a real maternal outlook. She would leave hammers and other implements about the house where the boys could get a hold of them. She didn't seem to realise that certain objects could be dangerous in the presence of the boys. Colin only had contact with Sheila or his sons intermittently on the occasional weekend and during the holidays at this time. In October 1980, when the twins were six months old, Sheila tried to return to modelling and was employed by the Penny Personal Management Modelling Agency in London. The company had no hesitation in offering her a position. Her first photo shoot took place on the 24th of October 1980 in an advertising promotion for Peugeot Cars. But again, she found it hard to cope and completed her last assignment just six months later, but was now an unemployed single mother. Sheila met Iranian Farhad Imami, commonly referred to as Freddy, in 1981, and they immediately struck up a friendship. Freddy realised Sheila was vulnerable and needed a friend. He helped out and would babysit for the boys and also became Sheila's confidant who she often turned to to discuss her problems. However, as much as he was there for Sheila, it was Freddie who introduced her to cocaine, which Sheila took along with other recreational drugs including marijuana, which she smoked frequently with Colin. Unknown to anyone at that time, the use of recreational drugs affected and exacerbated her mental health issues. Camden Social Services became involved with Sheila and the welfare of the boys just before the twins were seven months old and she was introduced to Judith Jackson who became the first foster carer for Nicholas and Daniel. Mrs Jackson cared for the boys each weekday. Every morning Sheila took them to Judith's home and each evening the twins would be taken home by Mr Jackson. Judith told the police I found Sheila scatty and childish like a 16-year-old child with two babies. It was impossible to hold an intelligent conversation with her. She was a loving mother who lacked basic childcare. I also recall that Sheila worked as a domestic cleaner in Hampstead somewhere. She also said she massaged some old man once a week. The boys remained with Judith for 18 months before their care was transferred to Mary. Pat Lester, who explained, The reason the twins were put into my care was, as far as I can remember, that Sheila was unable to cope with them on her own. This arrangement remained in place until August 1982, when Sheila moved to her flat in Maid of Ale. On May 3, 1983, an incident occurred which required social workers to become involved with Sheila. Travelling with his mother, 
Nicholas fell out of a moving taxi and the head injury he sustained required hospital treatment. Sheila maintained that whilst the taxi was travelling on the North Circular Road, Nicholas had accidentally fallen from the moving car. Nicholas remained in hospital for three days. Social workers were suspicious as to how he fell from the vehicle, but sadly, alarm bells did not ring loud enough and Sheila was not investigated after the incident. When Sheila moved to a different district of London, to a flat in Maida Vale, the foster care which had helped her and the twins enormously now stopped. And Sheila was upset about this as she had relied heavily upon the assistance that the foster carers had provided. Camden Social Services had, however, passed Sheila's case files to Westminster County Council social workers and she was registered on their books, but they continually let Sheila and the twins down by their lack of involvement. Team leader of Westminster Social Services, Michael Abel, was appointed to review Sheila's case and after reading the files sent from Camden Social Services, he realised that two conferences had taken place about Sheila and the twins and concerns had been raised about the health care of the children. In his witness statement to the police in September 1985, Michael recalled what he had learned about those meetings. The first was held on the 4th of August 1981, where from the minutes it was discussed about the concerns of the mother's lack of ability to seek medical advice promptly when the twins were ill. There is a reference that at this time there was a scold on the left knee and stomach of Daniel and an ear infection. It is also mentioned that there was a burn on Daniel's cheek. In this conference, Sheila is described as forgetful and disorganised. Not only was Sheila unable to cope, but the evidence here demonstrates Sheila's neglect and probable abuse of the children. Another witness, Sue Ford, gave evidence that Freddie had told her that Sheila had been physically violent towards the boys. He spoke quite a lot about them, especially after having Sheila with the twins and having seen her being violent towards them. He said she used to punch them directly in the face. Very harsh treatment, face, directly. Colin Caffell, Sheila's ex-husband and the twins' father, also disclosed in evidence. Sheila was daydreaming a lot and seemed to be in a world of her own. As a result, the children were prone to accidents. Social services did not investigate the cause of any injuries to the children. Had they done so, they may have been alerted to Sheila's deteriorating mental health and have realised the possibility that the children could be in very real danger. After the tragedies, Jeremy told the police that the discussion at the table that evening prior to the tragedies concerned the possibility of the children being fostered again. When the Eatons and Bowflowers heard about this, they asserted to Essex police that Jeremy was lying and gave evidence to the police that they flatly refused to accept this being discussed it is generally agreed that under no circumstances would June and Neville have agreed to or even discuss such a thing. DSI Ainsley made a report in order to have Jeremy charged with murder. In his interim report to the DPP in September 1985, he stated, I think it's only right to say that Jeremy is the only source of such a suggestion and he has been quite active in spreading this information. Or, as I would believe, misinformation. Every person who knew Ralph Neville, June and Sheila are all agreed that this is an outrageous suggestion and would never have been suggested or entertained by these persons, not forgetting the natural father, Colin Caffell, whose authority would have been required and I might add, not forthcoming. In his final report to the DPP in December 1985, written to commit Jeremy to court, he then informed the DPP. There was mention of foster parents along with other solutions. I think it only right to say that Jeremy is the only source of such a suggestion. Every person who knew Neville, June and Sheila are all agreed that this is an outrageous suggestion and would never have been suggested or 
entertained by these persons. DCI Ainsley lied yet again as by November 1985 he had a minimum of eight witness statements written by social services and foster carers of Nicholas and Daniel. He also had a statement from Colin's mother. I remember just after Sheila's second illness, I spoke to June Bamba on the phone. She conveyed to me then of her concern that through Sheila's illness, the boys might be put into foster homes. Yet this information was not disclosed to the jury and they were told that Jeremy lied and was the only source of this information. Living on her own with two small children exacerbated Sheila's insecurities and her confidence issues and she became obsessive about her appearance, constantly asking friends how she looked. This is a factor which many of Sheila's friends would refer to in their witness testimonies. Jane Robinson said sometimes she would come around before she went out asking her opinion on her looks and appearance. However, from July 1985, Sheila's appearance dramatically changed and by this time she was working part-time one morning a week as a cleaner. Her employer, Mr Williams, said he felt sorry for her. Her general appearance was untidy and she smelt quite badly of body odour. Normally her clothing was quite unkempt and on one occasion I noticed she had a lot of holes in her tights. In fact, after the tragic events of the 7th of August 1985, Mr Williams did not recognise the beautiful, well-groomed Sheila depicted in newspaper articles as the same untidy and unkempt girl who had worked in his store just a matter of a few days earlier. He stated to Essex Police, The Sheila working for us was not recognisable as the girl in the papers, though I accept it was the same person. In 1983, Sheila's GP had made a private referral for her to see a Harley Street consultant psychiatrist, Dr Hugh Ferguson. This was paid for by Neville and June as a means of avoiding a lengthy wait for NHS treatment. Sheila was admitted to St Andrew's Hospital, Northampton. Dr Ferguson's witness statement the day after the tragedies said that Sheila first started to experience schizophrenic symptoms in her early 20s. He said... When I first saw Sheila, I diagnosed that she was in a state of acute psychosis and had been so for about two weeks. It was evident that she'd been depressed and unconfident for the previous 18 months and had an increasing sensitivity about other people. The history of her case was of a slow onset followed by an acute breakdown inferring a poor outlook. During her treatment, I found that Sheila had bizarre delusions about possession by the devil and complex ideas about having sex with her twin sons. She thought her sons would seduce her and saw evil in both of them. In particular, she thought her son Nicholas was becoming a woman-hater and was a potential murderer. She said she felt as if she was caught up in a coven of evil. These feelings appeared to be involved with her relationship with her adoptive mother and her standards of good and evil. These things that she expressed were clear symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia. During the trial, Dr Ferguson said he'd also written to Sheila's GP. He said, I made mention of her unease about her reactions to the twins and that she was afraid she was capable of murdering them or communicating some ability for them to become evil or murderers at a later date. At trial, when discussing Sheila's relationship with the children, Dr Ferguson said that very disturbingly she was at risk of having to have sex with them or to join with them in some violence. He went on to detail that Sheila considered that Nicholas would grow up to be a woman hater or murderer. There was also a measure of her doing violence to her children and that she had a great deal of morbid thoughts which he concluded were abnormal, frightening, disturbed and in a sense irrational. In 1985, after four years of research, Sheila successfully contacted her birth mother and arranged to meet. However, days before this happened, Sheila had a serious psychotic episode which resulted in her being readmitted to the hospital at Northampton. Freddie explained. Sheila suddenly became hysterical, mumbling about the phone being bugged. She became like someone possessed, ranting and raving. She was striking herself and beating the wall with her fists. I tried to calm her, but she did not seem to hear me. I became extremely frightened, not only for her, but for myself. I contacted her ex-mother-in-law and asked her to come around. This aggravated the situation and Sheila became even more violent and abusive. 
I felt something nasty might happen. I was extremely scared for everyone's safety. At that time, I felt Sheila may use violence towards someone. This carried on until her father arrived in the morning and arranged for her admission into hospital again. One doctor who went to Sheila's flat that night stated, It's fair to say that if this woman's family had not been due to admit her to a hospital, I would have arranged a formal admission to the nearest mental institution. And Colin Caffell gave evidence that The doctor had said it was a good thing that my mother had called when she did. It was a wonder that Bams hadn't done any harm to herself already, or anybody else for that matter. Dr Ferguson said that when he examined her on this occasion, she was found to be psychotic and, this time, thought that her boyfriend, Freddie, was the devil. Sheila now also admitted that she used marijuana and smoked cocaine fairly frequently that year. Dr Ferguson's notes to this statement recall the use of amphetamine and he reported her condition would certainly be exacerbated by use of illicit drugs. Sheila was discharged on the 29th of March 1985 and did manage to see her birth mother over four days before her return to Canada. Dr Ferguson arranged for Sheila's GP to administer her medicine by injection so that Sheila could not avoid taking it as prescribed. This was fortnightly by attending the GP for injections. Sheila was initially on 200 mg of haloperidol. However, in July, this was wrongly reduced to 100 mg. Dr Ferguson had suggested it be reduced by 50 mg, but mistakenly, the new GP, Dr Wilkinson, who had worked at the practice for a couple of weeks, halved the dose to 100 mg. Therefore, by the 7th of August 1985, Sheila was seriously under-medicated. Not only was her dose of Haldol mistakenly halved in July, but the fortnightly injections she'd been receiving had now also been changed to being monthly. Sheila probably wasn't suffering tremors because she had asked the doctor for the anaphronel, which she took to counter this side effect, to be stopped. It is therefore unlikely that Sheila would have had any problems with coordination or loading the rifle. At the trial, Dr Wilkinson said that she read Sheila's notes and although 150 mg of haloperidol had been prescribed, I thought 100 mg would do. In addition, the injection which was supposed to be each fortnight had been inadvertently prescribed to be administered monthly. Therefore, the effectiveness of the drug had diminished catastrophically by the time of the tragedies. From the time of her second hospital admission, Colin gave evidence that the children were in his care 95% of the time and that he only visited Sheila with them irregularly and infrequently and said, Upon her release from hospital, I saw Sheila a few times with the boys. The lack of contact with the twins possibly further exacerbated Sheila's vulnerability. And at trial, he stated, Sheila missed the children getting desperately upset at the thought of anyone taking her children away from her. And Colin wrote a letter to Neville expressing his grave concerns about Sheila's ability to care for the children, telling him of comments made by the boys' teachers at school who said, they have been dropping far behind the rest of the class. Their behaviour has been erratic and moody. The letter also stated that Colin's mother had said, On most days, they had to dress themselves and fetch their own breakfast and then attempt to wake Mummy to take them to school. The day after Sheila was released from hospital, she spoke to teenager Helen Grimster at White House Farm. Helen told Essex Police, she asked me if I'd ever thought of killing myself and she said that she contemplated suicide on more than one occasion. She also said that she'd got to get rid of the evil in the world and she kept going on about this. But Helen was excused from giving evidence at trial. In Stan Jones's notes, it was evidence given by Barbara Wilson to him that Sheila had told her that all people were evil and should be killed. This, of course, never made it to the trial. Sheila wanted to get back with Colin and to have children in her life on a daily basis again. Just before the trial in 1986, a document containing handwritten pages were discovered which were the lyrics of three songs by Marianne Faithful. These were Broken English, Guilt and Brain Drain. The top right-hand side of the document says Signature, Bambi, Back of Cover, Top Left. 
it's unclear if the pages are in the handwriting of Sheila or a copy of what she had written created by a police officer. However, when they're compared to the letters which are known to have been written by Sheila, there are some distinct similarities in the writing, the style and the formation of letters. It's highly probable that these are copies of the original pages Sheila wrote. The songs are all emotional and deep in their meaning. It is often the case that people relate the lyrics of a song to their emotional state and they can become very personal to that individual. But in Sheila's version, the lyrics have been altered. The song, Broken English, has been changed from Could Have Come Through Any Time to Put a Gun Through Any Time. This song also contains the lyrics Lose your father, your husband, your mother, your children. What are you dying for? It's not my reality. The song, Guilty, contains the chilling lyrics If I could get away with murder, I'd take my gun and commit it. Prior to trial, Jerry Bamber's defence barrister, Geoffrey Rivling QC, obtained a copy of the vinyl record to listen to. However, the alteration of the lyrics by Sheila was never disclosed to the jury and never used in any part of Jeremy's defence. This is a surprising omission considering the implications of what these songs indicated was the state of Sheila's mind. Sheila wanted to get back with Colin and to have children in her life on a daily basis again. Colin was fully aware of this and gave evidence that, during discussions, she made it quite clear that she wanted me back. She also wanted the boys back. Sheila told friends she believed it was only a matter of time before this would happen and then they could once again live as a happy family. When Sheila attended a barbecue at a friend's house on the 1st of August, knowing that Colin, who was no longer in a relationship, would be there with the twins, Sheila made a special effort to look as beautiful as possible. People couldn't help noticing and said that they were like a normal family and Colin was commenting on how good Sheila looked and to see them as a family. They seemed loving parents. They both got along well together and were quite friendly. Two days later, Colin hosted a party at home and Sheila must have been excited, hoping she could further strengthen her relationship with Colin. However, Sheila was crushed when he introduced everyone to his new girlfriend, Heather. Witnesses later said that Sheila sat most of the evening, very quiet and not talking to anyone. At 4.30 the next day, Colin picked Sheila up. The twins were already in the back of the car and he drove them to White House Farm for the planned visit. Sheila didn't speak during the two-and-a-half-hour journey. Sheila was seen by several individuals on the day before the tragedies. Each of them gave an account of her appearance and behaviour. These included statements such as Sheila definitely did not look normal and that she was like a zombie in a horror film. At approximately 9.30pm, Barbara Wilson, the farm secretary, rang Neville and she described to the police that he was very short on the phone. I thought something must have been wrong and felt under the impression I'd interrupted something, possibly an argument by the way he sounded. Pamela Beauflower also rang the farm at 10pm and spoke to Sheila and June. This is what she said in evidence. I made all the conversation. Sheila simply replied yes or no. Whilst I was talking to Sheila, conversation suddenly stopped and June came back on the phone. I thought this was strange as she didn't even say goodnight, Auntie Pam, which she would normally do. Then June told me that Sheila had gone to bed. Then June told me that she was very worried about Sheila and that she would like me to see her and form an opinion about her health. As stated earlier from the evidence of several witnesses, including Colin Caffell, the fear of losing her children was great. The conversation about the future care of the twins and the suggestion of foster care, which took place around the kitchen table between Neville, June and Sheila on the evening of the 6th of August, must have weighed heavily upon Sheila. Her hopes of getting back with Colin had been shattered at a time when the incorrect and expired dosage of her medication must have had an impact on her stability. This had to be a trigger for tragic events which unfolded in the house on the 7th of August 1985. There are multiple ways that witness evidence shows that Sheila was alive in the house whilst Jeremy was standing outside with the police. We're now in a position to show that Sheila was alive and we have fresh evidence regarding the scene itself which shows that the police 
meddled with the scene, moving the bodies among other things, and later gave evidence which is not consistent with the actual scene photographs. A time of death was never recorded by Dr Craig, but we know that Sheila was initially in the kitchen before running upstairs as the police gained entry. She was heard upstairs moving about, and challenges were made for her to reveal her whereabouts. We know that Sheila inflicted a single gunshot wound to herself, which killed her, and that the second shot, which had been seen on the crime scene photographs, was not inflicted by Sheila. We can demonstrate that Essex police moved Sheila's body, hands and arms, and also moved items around her, and that she was not in a state of full rigor mortis at 10am that morning. If she had died between 10pm on Tuesday evening and 3.26am on the Wednesday morning, as the prosecution had stated, she would have been in full rigor mortis. The new evidence we have reveals that the jury were misled when they were told she had no signs on her body of being in a struggle. This argument was still presented by the Crown in 2002, but recently discovered was an earring missing from Sheila's ear shown in the x-rays and part of this was found in photographs of the kitchen floor. The remainder of it was trapped in her nightdress and we have the evidence that she suffered at least 28 additional wounds the pathologist did not record and one of these injuries on her hand proves that she had used and reloaded the rifle. We also have evidence that the police recovered a suicide note. This is in a statement by a police officer which he says reads I've just killed myself. Neither Essex Police or the Metropolitan Police deny that this note existed. Hughes and Mile, the first officers who attended the scene, said in witness testimony that Jeremy told them, I don't go on with her at all. I don't like her and she doesn't like me. Essex Police attempted to and needed to create the image that the relationship between the siblings was fractious and continued throughout the case, continually putting forward the assertion that Jeremy and Sheila did not get along. However, in reality, Jeremy and Sheila had a close relationship and evidence of this was given by numerous witnesses, including Colin Caffell, who gave evidence his relationship with Sheila was one of admiration, brotherly love. He was very proud of having a beautiful sister who was a photographic model. And a former girlfriend of Jeremy's, Sue Ford, recalled, she seemed to get on very well with JB. He was very proud of her. But the jury didn't get to hear this. In our next podcast, you'll get to find out more about Julie Mugford and her long string of criminal offences that were kept from the jury in 1986. There are a lot more evidential issues surrounding the testimony of Mugford, who cashed in on the tragedies, reaping in £25,000 from the news of the world that set her up for life. <laughs>